wonderful to be here. It feels like home. Um, I, uh, I have to admit that I had been watching the, act, the uh, activities in Rome with great interest because for part of the past two weeks, I thought I had some affinity with another retiree, right? He, <laughs> he too had life tenure and walked away from it. He too wore robes. He too, you know, had special guards guarding him. And he too, like me, is no longer infallible. <laughs> Having said that, uh, it's wonderful to be here. And to some degree, I want to I wanna bring this conversation to federal sentencing. Because I wondered, when I looked around the room, whether people were saying, this is all very interesting. And it's a policy question. And the commission or the Congress should take a look at these issues and perhaps restore some of the discretion to us uh, back again with these kinds of, 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 of devices. But I think it's actually, so I want to talk a little bit about federal sentencing and suggest that you can't get off the hook with that. There's obviously a considerable amount that people can do now that have come up this morning. So the disconnect with federal sentencing you all experienced, I certainly experienced listening to this, uh, the guidelines, the federal sentencing guidelines were supposed to include all the factors that anyone could ever want to consider. And all we had to do was apply them. Indeed, the federal sentencing guidelines had initially begun, been derived from the salient factor score, which it had been a probation risk assessment tool. The problem is, of course, that they went far beyond the salient factor scores and began to, was organized not around deterrence and not around a concern about recidivism. We all thought that initially. They were empirically derived, but they were not empirically derived by testing them against recidivism. They were empirically derived by just testing them about actual sentencing practices, and then they were embodied in the guidelines. So there were no deterrence studies at all, but we were supposed to enforce the guidelines. So, and, and Booker or no Booker, they still frame the discussion. And so if they are wrong and not taking into account the kinds of things people are talking about, then they are wrongly framing the discussion. The other thing about the guidelines were that although the, the, the statute talked about all the purposes of sentencing, the fact of the matter is that the guidelines were driven by a concern for retribution on the one hand and a concern to avoid disparity on the other. And how do we see that? So that all the kind of factors that have really leapt out at us during this session were excluded from federal sentencing. Diminished capacity. I'm sorry, you can't consider that. No meaningful discussion of mens rea. You can't take age into account. You couldn't take family circumstances into account. So the, the overarching philosophy was retribution, and you couldn't take those into account because if you did, sentences would be disparate. Age was a factor which could point up or down in terms of culpability. Family circumstances could point up or down in, in terms of culpability. And in a system that was more concerned with disparity than it was with rehabilitation or preventing recidivism, these factors were not going to be in the hopper. Uh, there's no question that as be we begin to talk about risk assessment technologies or risk assessment tools, there will be more individualizing. Right? The factors, the more elaborate the risk assessment tool, the more dynamic the factors that go into it, the more chance that Mr. A with robbery, armed robbery, will get a different sentence than Mr. B with armed robbery. Now, it will be warranted disparity, but it will surely be disparity. So this conversation has to head up, hit sort of head on with the overarching uh, purpose of the guidelines, which was to pre prevent unwarranted sentencing disparity. There will be a disconnect with retribution in more general terms. There will be a very culpable offender, and I think Steve Morse was talking about that, who may well wind up with a lesser sentence because of risk assessment tools. So we'll, we, this discussion is terribly important, but it really, has to, it really hits heads on with the regime that we've been operating under for, since the mid 1980s, both in terms of the factors that the sentencing guidelines made relevant and in terms of the motivating purposes of sentencing. We had supervised release, and, and I appreciate the comment that was made about supervised release, which in the, in the framework of this conversation gets more and more idiotic. Supervised release, we had supervised release that you, the period of time after you, uh, someone is in prison, and we were going to uh, determine that amount at the front end. 
And we were going to terminate the amount at the front end, not because it was the best time to make that decision. It is not. We were going to do it because of a policy concern. And the policy concern was to have truth in sentencing. The concern was that when parole officers made these decisions, judge would sentence to an indeterminate term. The parole officer would make a decision about parole. And the, the public would have anticipated the 15-year sentence, but in fact, the guy got out before that. So we had supervised release, which the judge would assign at the beginning. We have that now, really not for any policy concern, not for any uh, 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 scientific concern, not for any meaningful concern about rehabilitation, but solely the policy concern about truth and sentencing. And I, you know, I, I, um, uh, I read an article before I came here about someone criticizing supervised release and the outcomes on supervised release. And this was a young scholar who wanted me to read her paper. And she was saying, supervised release is idiotic under the federal sentencing system. We should eliminate it, and we should have people make decisions at the back end based on risk assessment tools. I thought, gee, where did I hear this before? <laughs> uh, but we are making this front end decision badly. And in fact, this piece made me realize that I almost never considered supervised release. I, got, I said whatever the probation officer gave me. And I spent a lot of time on sentencing. It was a shocking sense, because we thought the most important decision was the in-out decision and the length of time decision. So we never paid any attention to supervised release. And supervised release, in fact, under the, the statute, the sentencing statute, was discretionary, became mandatory through the guidelines. And the conditions imposed on supervised releases was discussed before really bore no relationship uh, to what made sense when a person got out of jail or out of prison. So we were imposing drug conditions automatically when you don't have to, even though when the person gets out of prison, the correlation, they, they, may, know, they may have gone through the RDAP program, there may have been no drug addiction at the beginning, uh, they may have aged out of the period of drug addiction, they may have gone through an educational program, their need for drug addiction treatment at the back end was getting more and more problematic, and yet we were imposing it. And it's not, it's not without costs. I'm not only talking about the costs of uh, drug treatment when you don't need it, but what, what we've all experienced, and I don't know what the figures are in, in, in the um, federal court, but there almost a third of offenders, at least as paper suggests, wind up back in prison uh, because of violations of supervised release. So we create conditions at the beginning, laying out what they're going to be after 5, 10, 15 year sentences, and which may not match the person who has come out. And we create tripwires, which then result in their going back in again, or at least raises the concern that they will be going back in again. The decision making around supervised release was perfunctory, uh, continues to be perfunctory and based on factors which we can't know about fully until they get out. So that has to be examined again, and that's something that could be examined right now. There have been other guideline systems. Uh, John talked about Virginia had a guideline system that was actually based on, dare I say it, data, uh, recidivism data, essentially tried to correlate it with risk assessment tools. And what was interesting about that system is that these tools in Virginia, not the sex offender ones, provided cover for judges who wanted to keep people out of prison. In other words, there would be the same kind of presumptive sentencing regime in Virginia, but if you met the standards of the, of the guidelines, then you could in fact say, I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna give you a probationary sentence, I'm not gonna give you time. And if you were criticized, you could say, well, look at the scores here. Look at the guidelines. Um, we, in, this, in, the, in the face of this very structured sentencing system with these guidelines based not on these kinds of issues and animated by retribution on the one hand and a concern about disparity on the other, reform has taken place in the interstices. Ann Aiken's program and program in Massachusetts and elsewhere that had back end re-entry courts, that is to say when people got out of prison, reentry courts, drug courts. And we did it at the back end because we couldn't do it at the front end. We did it at the back end and we did the best we can, but it, it, this is obviously not enough. 
the question then becomes, what does the Booker decision, the famous Booker decision, do to all of this? There's clearly a lag here between the uh, observations of this collo colloquium and even and federal sentencing even today. That is to say, although the guidelines are advisory, you start there. They frame, they anchor the way you look at these cases. They force you to begin there and then do variations on a theme of guidelines. And when I ask my, my research assistant to find cases dealing with risk assessment tools in the federal, uh, federal cases dealing with risk assessment tools, it was very interesting what we found. There is a Sixth Circuit case involving child pornography. Child pornography is where the rubber meets the road here. Child pornography guidelines are tremendously suspect. And in this one case, the defendant tried to prove to the judge the guidelines were at 78 to 97 months uh, for some of particularly nasty pornography, lots of images. But again, as is typical of these cases, no record, no, no, no record whatsoever. And numbers of a, a clinical assessment that this guy was not about to be a predator and was not likely to touch children, that he was a, a looker for whatever reason but not a doer. And a uh, risk assessment tool, numbers of them that had been administered on him, which suggested a, essentially a very, very low risk of, uh, of, of offending against children. Not necessarily, wasn't talking about child uh, pornography, but certainly no, a very low risk of, of being a pedophile. The judge in that case gave this offender time served, which was essentially one or two days from a 78 to 97 month guideline sentence. And he was reversed. And he was reversed. And he was reversed because of the, the Sixth Circuit rule was, uh, although they don't say it this way, was clearly that the distance between the guideline sentence and his sentence you had to really justify. They don't put it in those terms, but that's, that was clear. It was an, uh, uh, not an extraordinary justification. I think that the court has, the Supreme Court has said it doesn't have to be an extraordinary justification, but it has to be a pretty good justification to go that distance. And these tools were not that. These tools were not good enough. Uh, so it says something about the disconnect between our discussions here with respect to drug sentencing, certainly with respect to child pornography sentencing, the guidelines are, there. I can't say, I can say anything. The guidelines are way, <laughs> I always said it, you're, you're, the guidelines are way off base. The guidelines are way off base, are extraordinarily punitive. If one wants, even in a Booker world, to begin to talk about the kinds of things that we've talked about, the, using this data as justification, data as justification, not what I ate for breakfast, but this data is justification. The courts have to begin to catch up and recognize that this is, this can be relied upon. This is not just, uh, I don't believe in the drug laws or I love child pornography. This is real data. Um, there is a lag, as I said, this kind of data provides the kind of, I put it, is not the way to put it, but the kind of political cover that the Virginia guidelines provided to those judges. Um, in the New York Times about uh, just a last, this past Sunday, I think, or the, the week before, there was a wonderful article about a drug court in New York that had been implemented at the front end with the permission, with the consent of the U.S. attorney, uh, a drug court by Judge Gleason and others in, the, in Brooklyn who were using it. Um, but that needed to be negotiated. It was something an individual judge could not do. The reentry courts could, could, to some degree, the reentry courts at the back end, judges had a little bit more discretion because no one particularly cared about what happened when people got out of prison. The, the drug courts at the front end have to be negotiated. So where are we now? Um, there are, uh, on the one hand, if the concern is disparity, if the concern is if we go into this area, we're going to begin to get disparate sentencing. That, as I said, is a concern that is addressed to some degree by the fact, I hate to use the word, that these are evidence-based and that we're talking about data. 
there will be disparity, but that arguably this will be warranted disparity. And one of the things that I want to ask the Sentencing Commission to do, in fact, I've asked them to do, if the Sentencing Commission used its website as a place to publicize the studies that we've been talking about so that judges across the country can then sentence with that in mind. There's a guideline sentence on the one hand. You can talk about the guidelines, but in addition, there would be these data. Here's where they apply. Here's what, what the tools would be. Um, other judges have relied on them, essentially a clearinghouse for the studies that we would rely on to address some of the issues that Joan was talking about. We would have, we would have sentencing that would take this into account and arguably address the concerns of disparity. Um, there would be, is there a risk that judges will wrongly use this data? I was moved by Professor Morse's conversation about holding people accountable for, uh, responsible for, for drug addiction, uh, committing crimes. And I kept on thinking through that conversation that it was the kind of conversation you would have expected 40 years ago in a way. Because we were talking about drug addiction as a disease. We were talking about people not being uh, held accountable for all sorts of conditions. But our system has moved so, to be so retributive now, so retributive and so punitive, that if judges begin to mitigate sentences based on this kind of data, and some go too far, it will only be a, you know, a drop in the ocean uh, until there's more fundamental reform. So I'm not concerned about overuse of these kinds of, this kind of data to mitigate. Will it be used to aggravate a sentence? Is that a danger? Um, not likely. Uh, the sentencing guidelines, frankly, accomplished that quite successfully. It, it is an issue of mitigation for the most part, in addition to the extent that uh, lawyers ever get to deal with uh, fMRIs and sentencing. Obviously, only the defendant can get the fMRI. The government doesn't have access. Uh, so th is there a chance that this will have an extraordinary impact on judges, that judges will fall for this kind of evidence when they shouldn't? The, the literature is filled with all sorts of stories about judges who mitigated based on an abnormality in the brain that had absolutely no relation to any actual conduct. Yes, that can happen. Um, but there will be an appellate court that will say to the judge, there was no correlation between what you found and uh, the, the abnormality and what you found. Um, so the bottom line is that, uh, to be sure, these conversations should force a reexamination of the guidelines that we've been operating under for the past 30 years. No question about it. It should inform that discussion. It should inform a discussion in the Congress about supervised release. It maybe should inform a conversation about how a judge should impose one year of supervised release in certain cases, and anything longer than that is a decision that has to be made at the back end. It should inform that. And it's a different discussion than it had been 30 years ago. Uh, 30 years ago, we were, uh, rehabilitation was um, uh, an, uh, a hope. We didn't know what we were doing. The story about the federal sentencing guidelines is that they came about uh, in this extraordinary punitive way because of an article that had been written by a man named Robert Martinson who was asked, the title was, What Works? Answer Nothing. If we begin to reevaluate supervised release now, we're doing it on the basis of something. We're doing it on the basis of information. And if we, uh, bef if the guidelines are not reformed, and in this time when we still have discretion, I say we, I can't stop saying we, still have discretion, it seems to me that our decisions can be informed by the kind of information that we've talked about today. In certain circuits, do you risk being reversed? To be sure. But uh, that didn't stop me. It shouldn't stop you. Thank you. <laughs>